Okay, you guys remember how I showed you the maps that were here on Earth before 1958, before the governments took them out. Now I'm going to show you the Encyclopedia Britannica's in the public libraries before 1958. Here is volume two out of the alphabet A. And we're going to flip to the Antarctica, which, and this is from 1958, as you can see. Now, we're going to flip to the Antarctica and see what the Encyclopedia Britannica from 1958 before the Antarctic Treaty says is there. Now you won't find this in the new encyclopedias because the government's banned them. But what I want you to notice right here is notice how it says the flights proved inland areas to be featureless in character with a dome 13,000 feet high at about latitude 80 degrees south longitude 90 degrees east take a really really close look at that now I'm going to zoom it in for you when they returned to New Zealand these flights proved the inland areas to be featureless with a character with a dome 13,000 feet high at about latitude 80 degrees south longitude 90 degrees east now if this doesn't make sense to you let me show you with an image of what a flat earth map would look like now this is what a latitude 80 degrees south would look like on a flat earth map as you can see the dome comes down closer to you over the wall which would be about 13,000 feet now if you go back out into the center of the earth or up the north pole and try to go up to the firmament with a little bit of calculation it's going to show that it's about 385,500 feet away it's really really simple folks now if you're not familiar with any of this at all at all and you're just now new to the, all this it, you could say well this guy is crazy he doesn't know what he's talking about but what, but what you got to ask yourself is why do all the maps before 1958 show a flat earth with the ice wall around it and a firmament, a dome. And why does the encyclopedia tell you that there's a dome there and it gives you the exact height at a certain latitude and longitude? Well, the reason is, is because in 1958, that's when all governments and all nations of the world signed the UN treaty to ban all civilians from going to the Antarctica. And NASA came in and erased everything just like they're erasing everything today. So again, ask yourself, if all this existed, before 1958, why doesn't it exist now? How come it all of a sudden was erased and just disappeared out of your history books, out of your encyclopedias, out of your libraries? Wake up, people. Wake up. If you keep looking and keep looking and keep looking at the stars, looking at the sun, looking at the moon like I have and like I do, you really start to come to the conclusion that everything that, that's above us isn't what we've been told whatsoever at all. For instance, why is it that when you're standing in front of the ocean, the ocean looks greenish, but when you look at it from an airplane or from a drone or a balloon, the ocean is blue? And then conversely, when you're standing on the earth and looking up, the sky also looks blue. Well, maybe I found the reason. And I'm pretty sure I did. And this literally, no pun intended, just fell out of the clear blue sky into my lap today. It's really, really strange. But I think it's a bit of proof that I, for one, have never seen before, not even in the flat earth community. So check this out. It turns out in 1990, an Italian geologist, see, all these good guys are Italian like myself, named Angelo Patono was visiting Sierra Leone in the vicinity of the border of Guinea, Conakry to verify if a certain region of the country known as Kono was indeed rich deposit of diamonds. So you see, blah, 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 on and on they go. And then they go on to the story where they found this. And this is called the Sky Stone. Now, this is insane. I am almost positive, and I think they are too, they just don't want to say it, that this thing is a literal piece of the firmament. This rock is made up of 77.17%. Notice the three sevens. 
77.17% oxygen. And when they crushed this up to put it underneath the microscope, they could no longer see it. It lost its color. This is a real thing. This is an absolutely real thing. After returning to, to Europe, Petoni took the blue stone to the Institute of Natural blah, blah, blah. To his surprise, tests showed that stone was not turquoise. It wasn't even officially cataloged. The blue stone he had discovered not only does not correspond to any known mi mineral, but the same material was also, also recently located in Morocco. Do you see what's going on? The sky is falling. How's that? And they literally have imagery of it all over the place. This is the stone itself right here. And it's pretty amazing. It was found with all sorts of artifacts. And again, they tested this thing to 3000 degrees Celsius, yet its composition wouldn't alter. It was made out of 77.1% pure oxygen and the remaining was carbon, calcium, and another unknown element. They were eventually able to locate an organic compound that is currently unknown to science, dated at 55,000 years old. That doesn't really do very much for me. Amazingly, it seems that the sky stone is not unique. There has been, in fact, similar finds in other places on the earth, most notably Brazil. The other sample of sky stone was submitted to GRS Swiss Labs for testing and the analysis by an anonymous dealer. Intrigued artist, artist, American artist and designer Jared Collins tried to buy the small cutaway, but the dealer refused to sell it. He wouldn't even name a price for a larger full stone. So these guys have literally found these stones all over the world. And look at it. It's exactly, exactly the same color as the sky. It's made out of the same color. It's made out of the same elements that we literally breathe. This is, in my opinion, the firmament. Now, lots of people will try to, you know, what about the sun? What about the moon? In my opinion, the sun is incredibly close to us. And I can, you know, I've got hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of footage of the sun and the, you know, how close it is, how local it is, the sun doing odd things, what appears to be two suns, so forth and so on. And then there's people that have never-ending footage of the clouds behind the sun, the clouds behind the moon, so forth and so on. And now suddenly we're having this enormous solar eclipse Monday, and the shadow is going to pass from west to east, which if you had an object passing in front of another object, I guess you could cast a shadow from west to east. But the problem with that entire thing is it would mean the moon is orbiting twice a day around the Earth. And that's not what's going on because I've got imagery of the, the moon sitting outside my house all day, all day long in the clear blue sky, clear blue sky. I got a funny feeling that this stuff has been around, that these guys know this. And the one reason, the one true reason that they hide the flat earth, the one true reason that NASA is always doing their going to space puppet shows and, oh, you know, people have the technology to see the moon now, but so we can't go back there. We lost the technology and it's upsetting is because they know if they tried to pull another moon landing hoax, we have the ability to see if they actually landed there and they can't have that. They're hiding God and that's all there is to it. I don't know what else to tell you. Every other civilization knew it, and now they all laugh at anyone that questions this and says, well, this was proven 500 years ago. It was proven 500 years ago. No, it was, it was a rumor that was started by wealthy, rich, elite people 500 years ago that didn't even have the ability to fly up and test their theory. And yet today, the theory still stands, much like the theory of gravity, much like the, the theory and the testing that's been done on the Earth showing that it's not even moving. Do you really believe that we're flying through outer space at a thousand miles an hour, rocketing around the sun at 66? You know what I mean? It's all absolutely ludicrous and ridiculous, but I digress. This is what's all around us. That is a small piece of the firmament. I can't stress it anymore. This is a real thing. This really did happen, and I've never heard of it in my entire life. 77.17% oxygen and then one unknown element. They can't break it, they can't burn it, they can't bend it, and they can't explain it, and they're not selling it. This guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd.
The North Pole used to be a no man's land, but uh, these are the days when, by buying a ticket on a commercial airliner, you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. You know, only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any yes. unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that, unexplored. This is a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, Admiral a, an expedition to which I believe you're the advisor is now en route. Uh, what is that expedition doing? Well, that's the icebreaker ATCA. And it's a reconnaissance expedition. It's going down to the South Pole area to make certain observations and to, to look for some bases. They will be back in April, and they will report back. And upon the information we get from that undertaking, uh, we will base the bigger expedition that's to follow. Uh, is that very definitely planned, or uh, is that...? Uh, that is being planned right now. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year, at the bottom of the world, because the government has really become interested. Well, Admiral Byrd, I can understand, I think everybody can, the interest in the North Pole because it's so near our greatest challenger, Soviet Russia. But why this interest in the bottom of the world? Nobody living down there, is there? No, it's, um, it's pretty cold. There's only one permanent resident, that's the Emperor Penguin. The little ones live further north. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most... Uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. And uh, you know, as the world shrinks with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless, like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development and, and of air power increased their, the strategic importance of places like the oh, uh, very much Palmer so. Peninsula, was it? Uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica. I've then between there and Cape Admiral, you speak of the resources of Antarctica. What are they? What, uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains that's not covered with snow, enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world. Now, by far, the coldest spot in the world. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there, and there's evidence, probably uranium there. 
Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come when we can, we'll can. we have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fight over the Antarctic. And Robert, is there a competition among other nations to try to get information about uh, Antarctica and uh, possibly to secure some of these resources? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there are now seven nations very much interested. Russia is interested tremendously. That I'm sure of. Australia has an expedition down there. The Argentine, the Chile, New Zealand, Britain, and so on. Now, you can understand those people down there being uh, interested because they live down there, the New Zealanders, the Argentinians, the Chileans, and the Australians. And so uh, we, uh, we don't do much about claiming anything. Admiral, you uh, make this sound a little crowded. Uh, uh, are, are, are there that many expeditions now there or en route there? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long. Because of this intense interest... United States act decisively, we can make a real difference, not only far from home, but here at home. That's why we are launching No Ceilings. We want to know what we've achieved and what we have to do. I'm absolutely confident that we can send a clear, unmistakable message. Ceilings in America are unacceptable. Ceilings around the world that prevent education, health care, and jobs and opportunity are equally unacceptable. And we're going to be about the business of making sure that those ceilings crack. I was uh, very honored that the NASA chose me to be the first woman. This is a momentous day in my life. There are no doors we cannot unlock.